In the latter half of the 2000s, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy by Columbia Pictures and Sony is finally winding down as the studio gets into uncertain territory about the fourth film. Spider-Man's hit big in the world of video games with multiple open-world hits in a row, and the time has come for another animated series to keep the brand invigorated and alive as we wait to see what the next movie becomes. So cartoon vets Greg Weissman and Victor Cook were tasked by Sony to create a serialized Spidey TV series to fill in the gaps and breathe in some new life for the character after his last cartoon outings all kept him relatively the same as a college-age superhero. Believe it or not, putting him back in high school was not an incredibly annoying decision at that time. He was in high school for barely any of the movies, hadn't been there for decades in the comics, and the video games barely had time to show any of his life at home. So, Cook and Weissman took Spidey back to his roots as a 16-year-old high school superhero, with the plan for the series to span time through his school career from fall to summer vacation each year until he's graduated and moving on to college. They had a lot of big multi-year plans for this series that we'll talk about later, and I felt that was conducive to stronger storytelling because nothing felt like it came out of left field. The foreshadowing was implanted for everything that happened in the series, and it introduces characters long before they become relevant. So when they do take the center stage, you're like, oh yeah, I've seen that guy like three or four times before in the background. This show is a masterclass in setup and payoff. You can thank me later, dude. Yes, I will! <laughs> we all know now that these long-term plans didn't exactly come to fruition, as the show was canceled after two seasons due to the Disney and Marvel merger in 2009. And often the only conversations we have about this show revolve around that cancellation and how much we all wish it would come back. But you've got to be realistic and come to terms with the fact that this isn't really likely going to happen. Instead of being the millionth video encouraging a hashtag campaign to bring it back, let's just talk about what the show did and didn't do that made it so unique and appreciate it for what it is instead of lingering on what it unfortunately could have been. And yeah, what else is there to say? Spectacular Spider-Man is almost perfect. The Spectacular Spider-Man charts the early years of this show's take on Spidey as he grows and matures through his high school career as well as develops complex relationships with a massive cast of side characters that are all really strongly characterized. Every person he comes in contact with is an interesting and fleshed out character that could have multiple episodes about them too. But of course no one overshadows Peter Parker himself. This is a fantastic take on Spidey. He's angsty, but not too angsty. He's smart, but not too smart. He's a nerd, but not like a socially inept loser. He's also comic accurate in that he can't walk two feet without a girl falling in love with him. Don't you just love my balls? Hot, sticky, wet balls coming at you. He's flawed and makes genuine mistakes in the show that can't be rationalized away, and he learns from those mistakes. But he's still a lovable character. Of all the cartoons, I'd say this is definitely the richest and most complex take on Peter that translates him pretty much perfectly from the comics. Every adaptation focuses on specific traits in particular, but this one is the most well-rounded and complete translation I can think of. That spot-on Parker writing goes hand-in-hand -hand with this well-developed cast of friends and begrudging ally frenemies. His home life is so crucial because it sets him apart from other heroes. Subtle things like the multi-episode arc beginning with him being admonished by Aunt May for staying out too late on a school night. You're to be home by 10 o'clock. That's my bedtime. But Aunt May... If you're late, you call. And in the following episodes, having to call if he's up past his curfew. It's slow going, but uh, I'll, I'll be home soon. I hope so. The weatherman predicted rain. You don't have an umbrella. <laughs> yeah, somehow I doubt an umbrella would help. Little things like that make it feel more real, like he's a real kid. I love that this show managed to accurately show the evolution of enemies to friends that Peter and Flash Thompson have, in a way that felt natural and not forced or too quick. If you're hanging up on the she-geek, that proves you're still a stuck-up egghead. A guy who can't even see when his friends are trying to help. They even went so far as to adapt Harry Osborn's battle with drug addiction while also keeping it within the bounds of cartoon content restrictions. This is the only thing to ever adapt that arc, it's crazy. Like, even Semper couldn't finagle something like that. They just swapped out the heroine with a fictional performance-enhancing drug developed by Oscorp that he uses to get better at sports and improve his grades. I got straight A's on my midterms, I made the varsity football team first string, and I have a date to tonight's fall formal with one of the hottest Harry, girls in- Harry, can't you see I'm in a meeting? This show was written so well that they somehow managed to have a whodunit with Green Goblin 
and legitimately make you think that Norman Osborn isn't the lead suspect. I mean, you feel stupid when you realize it is because like, of, of course, but wow. It's like that Hobgoblin stuff, but good. Plus all the juicy girl problems and love triangles are just great. Somehow, Liz Allen is best girl. I don't know how to reconcile that. MJ is so barely in this show, but when she's there, she steals the show. The side characters are also perfectly handled. Kenny Kong is here, but he doesn't contribute much. Remember him? He's Brian Bendis' OC that's the only kid at school who could figure out Spider-Man's identity, and he also gets to date Kitty Pride, whom Bendis is obsessed with. That guy's not gonna be in the movies. There are also a lot of nice little indignities that remind you that being Spider-Man isn't all it's cracked up to be. Like Peter entering an intense chase sequence that spans the entire city and then realizing he forgot his shoes on a skyscraper. And now, the amazing Spider-Man is reduced to sneaking around for his shoes. Or burning his tongue on hot cocoa before a big fight. Yeah, are children present. What? I burn my tongue, okay? Not to mention his costume being too vulnerable to the elements in wintertime, and his laborious process to earn the funds to get some long johns under that shit. Fun in the sun, not so much in the snow. These things are the things that make Spider-Man down-to-earth and relatable. Relatable doesn't mean he's a self-insert devoid of personality, it just means he deals with everyday conflicts that feel like something your average person would encounter and struggle with. Spider-Man isn't 100% just me, he's a very distinct character. However, he and I have both stressed about paying bills or have possibly torn our pants in public. Being a normal person isn't totally glamorous, sometimes it sucks. And this show does a really solid job of portraying that aspect of the character without feeling like they're going overboard and dumping on him for the sake of it. Everything to love about this series is very nuanced. Everything is calibrated perfectly, not too much or too little of anything. So much of this show's Spider-Man and Peter Parker activities are so deftly handled, but what's a hero without a villain? A braggart and a charlatan! But a major factor of this show is its villains. Much like a lot of early Batman stories that focus on the transition from realistic gangland crimes to freaks and costumes, this series uses Spidey's introduction to the city as a catalyst for the same sort of evolution. All of his more down-to-earth villains like the burglars and crime lords are presented as having been around for a long while before he got his powers. And you see that genre of criminal being phased out in favor of animal-themed high-tech or super-powered goons that throw cars at each other. Even the old-style crime boss Silvermane gets a silly transforming battle suit to keep up, which is very reminiscent of that arc in the comics where he was a severed head and a robot like Robocop. They use that for Hammerhead in the new games. All of Spectacular Spider-Man's storylines run in three-episode arcs, in a way that makes them feel like four to five-issue arcs in a comic run. And these are all centralized very heavily around things he's learning at school and the education and or development of Peter Parker, as Greg Weissman put it. I find that this show follows my personal rules about the ideal way to adapt a long-running comic arc, which is to use what works and strengthen what doesn't. It's not a one-to-one -one adaptation of the Lee slash Ditko era or the Bendis and Bagley books because barring nostalgia goggles, both have completely different problems. Now Peter isn't a weird Ayn Rand reading edgelord, but he's also not dating his adopted sister Gwen Stacy. Comic books are bad, I'm so sad every day. For one, they did use the idea that Otto Octavius was a disgruntled ex-Oscorp employee who went mad from being abused by his boss all the time, but they decided to set this up as a framing device and introduce a lot of Spidey's enemies by having them be Oscorp rejects commissioned by the local mafia to fight Spider-Man. Here the idea works because it's paced out well enough, but this idea would later irritate the shit out of me in the movies and games by having Oscorp be the top supervillain factory in the world. Sometimes you just gotta have a criminal fall into a super collider, that's fun too. Gotta be careful where you fall. And the show has its fair share of villain origins like that too, with Electro, Venom, Kraven, and Mysterio being completely unrelated to Norman Osborn's shenanigans. They augment this more modern approach to Spidey villains by also including a lot of classic guys you don't see much anymore, like the Enforcers, the Tinkerer, and Silvermane. Naturally, they do little things to fit them in better into a more modern setting, but I think all of it works. Making Montana from the Enforcers become Shocker was kind of an interesting choice. I guess the reason that Oscorp being a supervillain factory in this show works is because, like, the criminals are hiring them to do that instead of them making Dr. Octopus arms and vulture wings and rhino suits and all this dangerous shit for, like, no reason. At least there was, like, 
politics happening behind the scenes that explained why they were building these crazy, stupid inventions. Really, the only change this show made to a classic villain that I don't vibe with was fusing Craven and Puma into, like, one character. He was cool without being a silly tiger guy, this was too much. We left the crazy furry villains on Counter-Earth, guys, please. This is also the only Spider-Man adaptation to not butcher the shit out of George Stacy, so that's cool. He totally knows he's Spider-Man, it's sick. Maybe a man in a mask doesn't have something to hide, but something to protect. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, sir. Normally I'd say that high school Spidey is too early to introduce Venom, but this series gets it right by developing that arc over a while in the first season and accomplishing two things. One, Venom is still an alien, and two, Eddie Brock has legitimate beef with Peter Parker without also being irredeemable. Somehow doing both of these is very hard for a lot of adaptations. Plus, making Eddie around the same age as Peter is sensible so he's not a 35-year-old man wanting revenge on a kid. College freshman, little man. But I'm guessing you're missing me at Midtown High, huh? He's like a perfect balance between the Ultimate and 616 version of the character. Seeing this series' version of Electro made me realize something. He's probably the least developed Spider-Man villain, in terms of personality or motivation. I may piss people off by making this point, but the fact that every version of Electro in movies and cartoons is so drastically different proves to me that there really isn't, like, anything interesting in the material to adapt for him. He's either the Red Skull son or a bullying victim that becomes a metaphor for Columbine, or a guy with a severe sci-fi medical condition that pushes him into this whole Hollow Man bit, or a socially awkward nerd that has severe abandonment issues. Remember in Web of Shadows, that whole I gotta save my sister thing, even though that was a character that was made for that game? At best, in the Ultimate cartoon in the recent game, plus Spider-Man No Way Home a little bit, they all shared this weirdly defined goal of becoming pure energy or something like that, but that's so vague and uninteresting. We have no concept of something like that because it's not real, so we can't, like, understand why he wants that so bad. You know, with every version of Doc Ock, the specifics of how he gets his arms and his relationship to Peter Parker are different, but he generally always has the same characterization. With Electro, it's always some random nonsense that has nothing to do with the comics because there's, like, nothing to adapt. Nearly every Spidey villain has some kind of storyline that goes in depth about them or at least a series of issues that defines a strong characterization for them. Rhino tried to quit crime and marry that nice lady he met at a diner. Shocker is like a down-on-his-luck, working-class supervillain that's trying to make ends meet instead of world domination. Sandman has a pretty strong moral code and sometimes serves as an ally to Spidey and even became a reserve member of the Avengers. They tried a bunch of shit with the lizard that didn't work, but at least they made attempts. Go watch that video. And thank god this show dispenses with all of that and, like, makes him turn into the lizard once and only once and then that's it. But what does Electro have? He's, um, kind of a mutant, but not really. He's bisexual, I guess? He was once the face of an anti-establishment political movement during the 2008 financial crisis. That was weird. One time he almost blew himself up by plugging his ass into a billboard and then thanked Spidey for saving him. Maybe there's like a really good single issue Electro story in an anthology book that I missed, but I think he like, kind of sucks actually now that I think about it this way. Electro's just there to fill out Sinister Six rosters and everything. He's got nothing going on. But I'm getting sidetracked. Now this one's a bot. A bot about to... Oh, fudge. Only I didn't say fudge. I said the word. The big one. The queen mother of dirty words. What the fuck? When I said this show planned ahead, I meant it. There's a whole slew of background characters from the comics that fill out the cast, with the plan that they'd eventually become major characters in the forefront of the story. They throw that stuff in for the assholes like me that actually read all the comics, or at least all of them until the concept of Kindred made them permanently allergic to them. Look, they got Stan Carter before he became the Sin Eater, and he's voiced by Biff from Back to the Future. That voice fits him really well, actually. Oh, come on, DeWolf. Kid's just saying what everyone's thinking. Look, Sarge, when he takes the law into his own hands, he goes too far. You ask me, Spidey hasn't gone far enough. It's kind of dark that his partner is Gene DeWolf, knowing how that would end up later on. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> 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 
Uh, sorry. I missed. Uh, let this be like a wake-up call to turn your life around. Ow. Butthole. Ow. Uh, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. <laughs> Look, we got Cletus Cassidy over here in this institution for deranged criminals. He doesn't talk, but you know he probably murdered his grandma in this continuity too. There's Hydro Man, voiced by Bill Foggerbocky. When we're clear, I remote activate the countdown, and cascading detonations bring the building down in its own footprint. Roderick Kingsley, the guy who is actually the Hobgoblin instead of the seven other guys we thought it was? I've heard somewhere that this sleazy reporter guy is actually meant to be Mac Gargan before Jonah ruined his life. We even got Miles Warren preparing for clone shenanigans by messing with people's DNA. They were gonna do the clone saga and that blows my mind. I know people used to trash this show for its really unique art style, but I've learned to love it with time. The characters are designed by comic artist Sean Galloway in his distinctive art style, with big emotive faces and exaggerated proportions. I think considering his art from around this time, this show did a really good job of tempering it down to something more pretty in animation form. Which they also did shortly before this with those two Hellboy animated movies that shared a lot of the crew with this series. I wasn't sold on it at first either, you know, when I was 10 years old and had my dad pirate this show for me because they never actually played it. But eventually I came to an understanding with everyone's weird action figure elbow joints. It's less noticeable when they have sleeves on, but what the fuck is going on with Harry? The art style does lend itself to animation very well, however. Everyone is simplified just enough to get them in and out of some really dynamic poses really quickly. So you go from this... Oh man, I've got three science papers due Friday. I have to study all night for a big exam, and I'm still batting zero with Felicia. To this... Spidey hasn't moved like this in 2D before or since. The fight choreography in this series is only rivaled by the MTV Spidey. If there's anything I still can't quite reconcile with the look of this show, it's the very earthy, muddy color palette that felt like a lot of shows from around this time. Everything is brown and beige and dark green and really dull blues and grays that holds back the very fun character designs. I do wish this show was more colorful at times. I like that John Jameson isn't a werewolf in this show. I love that this series has memorable locations that we visit again and again. The recurring set pieces lend a really strong sense of realism, like this isn't just an infinitely large cartoon city with a billion skyscrapers. It helps all this feel so real. From Peter's life at the high school in the Bugle, to the criminal underworld with recurring locations like Tombstone's Auto Shop and Penthouse, Norman Osborn's Penthouse and Oscorp, and Montana's bar that eventually is given to Russian Spike Spiegel while Shocker's in jail. Oh yeah, the voice cast! Bunch of fucking A-listers in this damn show. They got Revolver Ocelot to be Peter Man, and for many people, he's like the definitive voice for that character. John DiMaggio's range is insane because he voices two characters in one scene talking to each other, and I can't even tell. You got power no one else got. Not even Spider-Man. Revenge is for chumps. I don't care about Spider-Man. All I ever wanted was the big score. Every guy who played Spider-Man in a video game from around this time is not Spider-Man in this show, and it's pretty great. Keith David was Tombstone for one episode for some reason. I like to think that he was still Kevin Michael Richardson at this time, but he just sounds like Keith David over the phone. Like, I sound like my dad over the phone, but not in person, you know? I always wondered why that is, but I feel like if I ever asked Keith David at a convention, he wouldn't even remember this show and, like, wouldn't have a clear answer. Oh, you know, he did that same thing for Young Justice. He plays Mongol for one episode and then dips. Maybe he's just really busy. Fucking Freddy Krueger is the Vulture. And season one, Meg Griffin is Gwen Stacy. And I think this show and Emma Stone are the only reasons people under the age of 40 even like that character. And of course, Steve Bloom kills it as Green Goblin, who is the main villain of the series. Ah, but the Green Goblin doesn't take orders from insects. The Green Goblin swats them into oblivion! I also think Alan Ratchins is like the perfect Norman Osborn voice and will never be topped ever. Enough! You whine more than my son. I can't have weak men in my organization, Otto. That guy's IMDB is funny because he's barely in anything, especially not much voice work. He's one of those actor for hire types that just appears in small single episode roles in live action shows. And then randomly, he's also the best Norman Osborn voice ever. 
Uh, he's also the Clock King one time, to be fair. I love this voice cast, and I always get excited when any of them reprise their roles in other media. Although, Josh Keaton should have reprised this role in another animated series from around this same time. Yeah, we're talking about that mess. So, for those who may not know, this cartoon was intended to be part of a shared animated universe. Much like the now beloved DCAU or the 90s Marvel Animated Universe. This universe was helmed by Christopher Yost, and unlike the others listed, all of the shows in this one were on completely different networks. With Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes over here on Disney XD, and Wolverine and the X-Men on Nickelodeon, and Spectacular Spidey being all over the fucking place, I could never keep track, and that's why I had my dad pirate it. The CW under Kids WB, which was immediately consumed by four kids, and then transferred to Disney XD once the merge happened. The connections in this universe are thinner, but they're there, like Wolverine and the X-Men cartoon bumping into the Hulk, and then mentioning the animated film where they first met. Or Thor and the Enchantress carrying over their beef from the double feature into the Avengers show. In all three things, Hulk and Bruce Banner have the same voice actors and generally the same design. Which is kind of nuts because it means that Nolan North's Deadpool is technically the one canon to the spectacular Spider-Man universe. Or at least, you know, that was the intention. But Disney bought Marvel and the TV rights to Spider-Man. Not the movie rights, mind you, and that's still tenuous to this day. But they had all of Spidey's TV adventures on lockdown. And some pencil pusher decided it would be easier to drop this show and start fresh with something more under Disney's management and control, rather than delegate with the crew that was already working on this. Thus, the planned crossover episode where Spectacular Spidey would have met the Avengers was redubbed at the last minute with Drake Bell to lead into the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon. This was done so last minute that they forgot to swap one of the lines and you can still hear Josh Keaton's voice come out in one scene. Is this safe? No, it's not. All of this making the Earth's Mightiest Hero Spidey a strange Schrodinger Spider-Man that is neither ultimate nor spectacular, but some twisted form that lies in between. I'm Spider-Man. What's wrong with your voice? <sighs> I have a feeling a lot more of this was Spectacular Spidey influenced earlier on. Darren Norris doesn't voice Jonah, instead they got J.K. Simmons to prepare for his return as Jameson in the Ultimate Show, but Darren Norris is definitely in this episode. We checked security cameras. It was pushed over by an angry mob. I bet he got recast too. And with Betty Brant, they didn't even try to recast her, so she's still Grey Griffin. He doesn't have that spider signal in the Ultimate Show, but you know where he does use it? This episode is kind of a weird epilogue to Spectacular and a backdoor pilot to Ultimate because Peter mentions he's 17 years old. Uh, I'm 17. Respect your elders, punk. His design changes could be attributed to age, but the bagliness of him seems like another way to visually prepare the audience for the new show on the horizon. I'll tell you that the Avengers crossovers being canon to Spectacular is a lot more likely than Ultimate because Luke Cage and Iron Fist completely desync it by not being teenagers. Otherwise, there's nothing in these Avengers episodes that says it can't be Spectacular Spider-Man if you care about that shit. Whatever, canon is a cruel and fickle mistress that doesn't love you. Much like Spider-Man 94, this show was the point of inspiration for a lot of the creative choices in the movies that followed it. I suspect because lazy-ass screenwriters would rather get cliff notes from a few episodes of a cartoon than actually read a bunch of comics. The guys who made the cartoon did the research for you. So, we got Scientist Gwen Stacy, Max Dillon's powers coming from electric eels, Oscorp building Rhino's suit, Montana being Shocker in Homecoming, Vulture trying to get revenge on a rich guy that wronged him when he was just a scientist, Ned Leeds' redesign as an Asian American, blindfolded Spidey beating Mysterio by just not looking at all of his holograms, and Mysterio working with Tinkerer and Chameleon, etc. I did say almost perfect, so I need to find things to complain about because everyone thinks I'm the angry negative guy, I guess. Even though the majority of my videos are about things I like in the last three years. Uh, what are some things that aren't awesome about this show? Sometimes the music choices feel really dated like stock music from the time. And uh, other times it seems like the composer just gave up and reused some of his work from Batman Beyond. Hit the alarms! It's... 
Making Walter Hardy Uncle Ben's killer was dumb. He's supposed to be like a master thief, but he robbed the fight promoter in broad daylight with a witness around and no mask on, then he jacked a car while leaving a gunshot victim. That's not stealthy. That's not classy. I know the idea was to create some your dad killed my dad drama between Spidey and Black Cat because that was preferable to her scrommeting on his balls because he's underage or whatever, but I don't vibe with it. Hey, Spidey never does anything easy. I never asked to be Spider-Man. I never asked for these powers. We all wear masks, Spider-Man. But which one is real? My father's struggling. There's no place you can hide. A guy who can't even see when his friends are trying to help. Tonight you're in a particularly unfriendly neighborhood, Spider-Man. You just hit the jackpot. Accept the gift. The Parker rejected. We're Venom! Just once, I'd like to be early for school. Put me down! It's for your own safety, Pickle Puss. Innocent, but still at large. Guess you can't win them all. So what if nobody threw a parade? Spidey stays because Spidey's needed. Maybe a man in a mask doesn't have something to hide, but something to protect. Hey, if I wanted all the glory, I wouldn't wear a mask. If you're subscribed to this channel, you've seen every episode of this multiple times, so there's no point at all in convincing you to watch it or recommending it. So I'll just say I'm glad I rewatched it, and I plan to do so every few years instead of failing to grapple with the cold hard reality that this will never get a third season. Learn to let go, kids! You see, I'm trying to reverse jinx it because if I play the pessimist and say that this will never come back, the chances that it might increase so that everyone can come back to this video at some point and comment and say that it aged poorly. I'm an agent of chaos! I don't have some profound conclusion to make on this show that hasn't been said a million times before already. It's a show made by people who really love the character. The cast is great, the animation's really cool. Uh, it sucks that it didn't get to get the more seasons. Clearly it had an insane amount of untapped potential. But even what little of the show that we did get was incredibly high quality stuff. And I think we have to keep appreciating it for what it did do, in addition to wondering what it didn't get to do. Who knows if it'll ever come back, but I'm happy with what we got. I'll probably do Ultimate sometime soon, and next if you want, but you gotta keep fueling the space truck. These videos are getting expensive to make because I keep making Robocop costumes and flying guests to the studio, which is just my house so we can be on a blue screen like the real movies. You can support the channel by joining my Patreon that's only a dollar, or buy some of my old toys and junk on eBay, or you can buy some of the merch, or you can just use my Fortnite creator code because you probably play Fortnite, or you can just make sure to hit that bell icon, assuming that actually does something still. I don't know at this point. See you next time, goobers!